Laura told me that one morning she found a note from her husband on the kitchen table. Allow me to quote the contents. Dear Laura, I'm in love with my seeker. MY attorney will fill you in on the details. Wish you and the children good luck. How did Laura, a housewife with three small children, respond to this information? She was determined not to return to her old job and ate a high school teacher. Nor would she ever ask her well-to-do parents for economic support. She had grown up in an environment that nurtured independence and discipline. She wondered what she could do with undergraduate and master's degrees in English literature. She discovered that people with her educational background were in great supply and reasoned that her income from her teaching, editing, and writing jobs were not likely to be enough to support her family's current lifestyle. Thereupon, Laura discussed various employment opportunities with several enlightened Boosie, Ness owners in the community. After these discussions, she decided to try the field of real estate sales. During her first four months, she earned more selling real estate than she did in her best year teaching English. I know you would want to ask Laura the factors she feels contributed to her success. She told me this. It's amazing what you can do when you set your mind to it. You'll be surprised how many sales calls you can make when you have no alter. Native except to succeed. As a young woman, Laura had developed an excellent foundation for her sales career. While attending school, she had convinced dozens of employers to hire her for summer jobs. She also had a variety of part-time jobs while attending high school and college. Laura was so good at finding jobs that she helped many of her friends rind employment. No doubt she could have had much success in S.W.I.N.G., an executive recruiting firm. Laura was also the campaign manager for several of her friends who won student government offices in both high school and college. It's ironic that Laura's misfortune in marrying a man who lacked integrity eventually translated into a much better life for her and her children. Because of his transgressions, Laura was able to fully utilize all her talents. The irony is that she always had more potential than her husband to excel in the business world. It's a proven fact today. She is much better off than her former husband. Her success is also a function of her high level of integrity, something that was lacking in her former husband. After several banner years as a sales professional, Laura founded a highly successful real estate compacty. In spite of her dramatic financial success, she still flies on the red eyes and early birds. You would never think this woman had so much courage and stamina just by looking at her. I would estimate that she is bare. L.Y. 5 feet tall and weighs no more than 95 pounds. However, as we have often agreed, appearances are much less important than the courage, discipline, and resolve of people who are economically productive. A-F-F-I-R-M-A-T-I-V-E-A-C-T-I-O-N F-A-M-I-L-Y-S-T-Y-L-E. Their adult children are economically self-sufficient. Most affluent parents who have adult children want to reduce the size. M of sense, their estate given that the alternative before they pass away is to leave certainly this their children decision with makes a significant estate tax liability. The decision to share their wealth with their children is easy. The difficult decision is how to divide the capital. Affluent parents who have younger children usually believe that the distribution of their wealth will never be a problem. They assume their assets will be distributed equally. Those parents with four children, for example, typically state that their wealth will be distributed equally among their children, 25% to each. This simple distribution formula becomes more complex as the chill. Dren mature. Parents of adult children are likely to find that some of their children have a greater need for substantial financial gifts than others. Who should get more? Who should get less? These are K's. Tines everyone must answer. Nonetheless, affluent parents are likely to benefit from several important research findings. Parents with non-working adult daughters and temporarily unem. Floyd adult sons have a high propensity to provide these children 
with heavy doses of economic outpatient care, EOC. These children are also likely to receive a disproportionately large portion of their parents' estates. The more economically successful offspring are likely to receive smaller levels of EOC and inheritance. Many of the most highly productive sons and daughters receive no wealth transfers whatsoever. Yet, as we have discussed in Chapter 5, that's one reason they're wealthy. Housewives, A or B. Much of the variation in gift giving among different children can be explained by occupation or socioeconomic status and gender. We have found that housewives have the highest propensity of all major occupational groups to receive inheritances as well as periodic financial gifts from their parents. See Table 6, 1 and 6 to 2. In fact, housewives are three times more likely to receive substantial inheri tanks from their parents than are adult children of the affluent on average. In essence, housewives rank first in both the size of their inheritances and the incidence of inheriting wealth from their par. Hence, they are also most likely to receive significant financial gifts on an annual basis. We have identified two distinct types of housewife daughters of the affluent will call them type A and type B. Both benefit to different degrees from their parents' beliefs that non-working women must have money of their own, that the economic deck is stacked against women, and that sons-in-law can never be fully trusted to provide support for their wives and children. The type A housewife differs significantly from her type B counter. Part. Typists tend to marry high-income producing, successful men. They tend to take leadership roles in caring for their elderly, sometimes disabled, parents. The gifts and inheritance they tend to receive are, in part, compensation for these efforts' efforts their working brothers and sisters are more likely to shy away from. Type A housewives are well-educated and tend to be the executrixes or co-executors of their parents' estates. They are likely to be leaders and volunteers in various local educational and charitable organizations. Type A housewives are often viewed by their parents as peers and confidants rather than understudies. They are seen as intelligent, strong leaders and advisors and are frequently consulted about imper. Tant family matters such as estate and retirement planning, the sale of a family business, and the choice of professional service providers. Typists are also conversant with estate tax laws. They are likely to encourage their parents to reduce the size of their estate and thus minimize the estate tax by providing gifts to their children. Type A housewives receive substantial cash gifts throughout the early and middle stages of their lives, often from the time they are married. Later, Gifts are associated with the purchase of a home and, in some situations, the purchase of investment real estate. The presence of a type A housewife is of great benefit to affluent parents as well as to their other adult children, since type is often carry the enormous burden of providing for the emotional and medi cal needs of their elderly parents. Type B housewives, in contrast, are viewed as adult children who need economic outpatient care, and even emotional support. They tend to be dependent on others and are unlikely to be leaders in any capacity. Type BS tend to marry men who are not likely to produce high incomes. They tend to be less well-educated than the women in the type A category. The parents of type B housewives often subsidize their daughters. Household income in order to help their daughter's family maintain a Minimum middle-class lifestyle. Type B housewives tend to live in close proximity to their parents. They often accompany their mothers on shopping trips. It's not unusual for middle-aged type B housewives to receive clothing allowances from their affluent mothers and fathers. Parents also care for their type B daughters via provisions in willed estate plans. They are provided with cash gifts and inheritance because their parents believe they really need the money. In essence, type BS are cared for by their parents instead of the other way around. The parents of type B housewives tend to hold back from distributing substantial cash gifts to their daughters out of fear that their daughters and their husbands may be poor money managers. 
Thus, cash gifts for type B housewives tend to be on a need basis, such as when type B's husband is between jobs or when there is a birth in the family. Gifts are often precipitated by crises and may range from direct cash payments to clothing and tuition reimbursement. Nonetheless, type BS receive the bulk of their parents' wealth in the form of inheritance. Often their parents' wills provide specific instructions regarding the dis, tribution schedule, and educational funds for their daughter's children. Often the family of the type B housewife never becomes financially independent. It is not unusual for the type B housewife in her mid-50s to still be receiving cash subsidies from her parents. Nor is it unusual for the husband of a type B housewife to work for her parents' business. In some cases, the level of compensation is substantially higher than the objective labor market would indicate. In other words, the son-in-law in these situations is earning more as an employee of his in-law's business than he would working for an object tithe third party. Even sons-in-law who are employed outside the family business often moonlight for the family, working part-time at premium wages for the family business or doing chores or odd jobs for their in-laws. Daughters who are not housewives but are employed in full-time positions are less likely to receive cash gifts and inheritance than their non-working sisters. But even daughters who are employed in high STA, Tuss occupations are more likely to receive cash gifts and inheritance than their economically successful brothers. Why? As stated previous, L.Y., affluent parents feel rather strongly that women, even working women, must have money of their own. They also contend that their sons-in-law can never be fully trusted to remain loyal, to support and protect their daughters. Actually, the affluent are rather perceptive in this regard. Our data indicate that more than 4 in 10 of their daughters who marry will be divorced at least once. Affirmative Action for W-O-M-E-N Affluent parents understand that the income-generating opportunities facing men and women in this country are very different. These parents tend to have their own form of economic affirmative action. Consider the following facts. Plus, women account for 46% of the workers in this country, but represent fewer than 20% of the individuals who earn $100,000 or more annually. In 1980, fewer than 40,000 women had annual incomes of $100,000 or more. In 1995, approximately 400,000 women were in this income category. This translates into a tenfold increase. By the year 2000, more than 600,000 women will have incomes in the six-figure and higher category. But, again, as in 1995, there will still be five men for every woman in this income category. Plus, women have made significant progress in regard to the proportion who graduate from professional schools. In 1970, for example, only 8.4% of medical school graduates were women. In 1995, nearly 40% were women. In 1970, women accounted for about 6 per cent of all law school graduates. In 1995, they made up nearly 45 per cent. A high-status occupational title does not automatically translate into a high income, however. A recent census headline stated, Earn. Ings gaps in 19,951 still apparent even for professional degree holders. In this regard, women employed in professional occupations in 1995 earned only 49.2% of what men in professional occupations earned. Plus, how do the salaries of men and women in high income producing occupations compare? See the results of our analysis in Table 6, 3. In 20 out of 20 of the highest income producing occupations, women on average earn significantly less than their male counterparts. For example, female physicians earn only 52% of what male physicians earn, female dentists earn 57.4% of what male dentists earn, female podiatrists earn 55% of what male podiatrists earn, 
and female lawyers earn 57.5 of what male lawyers earn. Plus, in 1980, approximately 45% of the women in the six-figure and higher income category did not work. Conversely, 55% earned $100,000 or more by employment. These percentages have not changed appreciably since 1980, nor are they likely to change through the year 2005. In sharp contrast, nearly 80% of the men in this country who earn $100,000 or more are employed. Most of the other 20% are over 60 years of age and retired, plus the vast majority of non-working women who have annual incomes of $100,000 or more inherited their wealth and or received substantial financial gifts from their parents, grandparents, and or spouses.